Oh, you should maybe you can take your jump drive back. Um, we got it from Sugar and Spice.
And Brad Dr. Boston has a vast research agenda. I spent some time looking through his corpus of work and could hardly decide what was the most exciting part to focus on. So I think I'll just say a few brief things, and if I've missed any things, you can let them know. But I think one of the most exciting things for me as a researcher about having Professor Sebastian here is that his research works on all parts of these sort of methodological questions, from the implementation of the survey to how we analyze the results to how we think about the development of the survey to begin with. And one of the neat projects he's been working on is the um, Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems Survey, which is a big national survey, and it's really exciting and not only works on the analysis, but also on the implementation and development of that survey. The other really cool work he's been pleased to be substituting is Dr. Ronald Hester, and this is analyzing the results of the National Comorbidity Survey for Adolescents. So this is a really neat survey looking at mental health in adolescents, and it's just super fascinating cutting-edge work. And in 2010, Professor Zuzlowski received the Long-Term Excellence Award from the, for Health Policy Statistics from the American Statistical Association. So you can know you can take him seriously. He's, he's been endorsed. And he's currently serving on the board of the Scientific Counselors at the National Center for Health Statistics. And looking through his publications, I noticed that he has authored more than 200 papers. And so we are really lucky to be seeing one of them that's currently in the works, and this will be on um, Using conventional storage kits for various balance. So this is something we may have thought about before, but I'm sure we'll get some good news in our next session. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as I always feel after hearing an uh, introduction like that, I'd like to meet this guy. Uh, <laughs> by the way, th th is this microphone doing anything? I don't think it is. It, it does. I don't know if you're if you're trying to record this. Uh, Anyway, they told you that it picks up sound. So this this is, as I said, the uh, the um, work on this paper is joint work with Fan Lee and and uh, Carrie Locke Morgan, to some of whom uh, some of you may know her from she's a recent graduate from the staff department. Uh, but it really goes back to one of Don Rubin's seminars where I learned about propensity scores back around, I don't know, 1989 or so, maybe, when, when you were first doing those seminars. And as a survey sampler, uh, we commonly think about weighting as a method for calibration of, of uh, survey data to match certain uh, constraints that are derived from external sources external to the survey. And so when Don started talking about propensity scores, uh, I, I immediately started thinking about how you would create a, a, a design using weighting that would uh, both provide the kind of covariate balance that, that controlling for the propensity score gives you and also be efficient in the sense of minimizing variance. And you know, wrote down a few notes and came up with something which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, and We've used this in some studies, but it wasn't until some young, ambitious postdocs and uh, junior faculty actually really had a stake in getting a paper published that we started writing up the paper, and which we hope to have done by sometime soon. So uh, the framing of this is that observational data are being increasingly used to try to make inferences about causal effects. and the, the first step of doing that is in the, in the approach that Don, among others, has, have been promoting, is to try to balance covariates between the groups. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that balancing covariates is not restricted in its utility to uh, studies of causal effects. So w one of the studies I worked on where we used these methods, which I think might have been most successful, was a comparison of outcomes in hospitals between 1990 and 2000. And I, I don't really think we can talk about that as a causal effect. Uh, you, you might have some causal hypotheses about that, but making a comparison between 1990 and 2000 is not causal in the sense that you could decide which patients you want to send to 2000 and which patients you want to send to 1990 and think about the uh, potential effect of, of making that choice. 
But nonetheless, when you, you, when you make a comparison like that between uh, two different periods, which is really a descriptive comparison at first, although you, you might make some causal argument about it later, uh, nonetheless, it, it's more interesting to look at the uh, comparison of con constructed populations of patients in 1990 and 2000 that have similar covariates. You're, you're not that interested in, in knowing that you, you have better outcomes in 2000 because the patients are healthier when they go to the hospital, or is that actually the reverse? You, have, you might have worse outcomes in 2000 because inpatient care is being used for sicker patients and healthier patients are being treated more on an outpatient basis. So this balancing of covariates, uh, which I think many people as they, they hear about the uh, propensity score approach are, are trying to attribute some kind of magical properties to uh, as giving you a causal estimate. Uh, you can think of it as purely descriptive, al although under certain assumptions you can also give a, a, a causal inference uh, interpretation to the comparisons that are balanced. So there, there are two common approaches to this, one of which is actually common and the other of which seems to be less common. Uh, matching links similar cases in some, under some definition in two samples, and, and then if the, you have cases left over that are unmatched because one of your groups has patients with, uh, well, members with certain characteristics that aren't, don't appear in the other group, then you have to discard the unmatched cases. And you can think of this, I, I think of this as a kind of bottom-up approach. It, it starts by building local balance uh, in the sense that the cases that are matched together are near each other in, with respect to some covariates and, and therefore close to being balanced and then builds up to a global balance out of the local balance. Weighting, I think of as a, a kind of a complementary approach uh, in, in which you uh, start by building a global balance using a, a weighting scheme that has known properties that create balance on certain functions of the covariates or, or certain summaries of the covariates. And then you can add more and more detail to the model in order to make that balance be uh, extended to smaller and smaller subgroups. In some sense, these two might meet, meet in the middle uh, as, as you get more and more detailed models or uh, aggregate more and more in the matching. So in, in the world, of waiting for covariate balance, there's a, a, a bit of a literature on this, and a lot of this literature focuses on particular weighting schemes uh, that uh, promote e either inverse probability weighting, sometimes called Harvard-Thompson weighting, and which I'll sh show you all these in a minute, which, which uh, attempts to create a population that looks like the combination of the two groups treatment and control groups, if you like, uh, and in some cases other uh, target populations such as the treated or some kind of an overlap group. And here what I'm going to try to do is to t provide a kind of a framework for what I call a balancing weight, and that will include these examples, and then talk about w one particular balancing weight called the overlap weight, which has some particular advantages. So suppose we have a, a sample of units from a population. Uh, we observe the treatment status or a group membership more generally and some covariates. And we have potential outcomes, yi0, yi1, in, in a causal setting. And we observe only the outcome of the actual treatment that was applied. And the key here is the propensity score. And this is just the probability of being in group one out of group zero and one given the covariates. So uh, we're going to add one, one more piece here, which is to define the population density of the covariates in the combined population, and we'll just call this f of x. Uh, this, this would be the density with respect to some base measure. Uh, I, I know we don't like to get into measure theory. So this is just a convenient way of covering both continuous and discrete covariates using the same terminology. So don't, don't attach any great 
uh, importance to the, to the base measure. So this induces two densities, the density in the treatment group and the density in the control group. F1 of X is proportional to the, the uh, base density for the combined group times the probability of being treated, and F0, uh, base, the base density times the probability of not being treated. So then you can define things like a conditional average treatment effect, uh, conditioning on being in a, in a particular value of the covariates. Uh, and all this means is if you were able to collect a lot of observations that had the same value of the covariates, you could look at the average of the outcome in the treated group and the average of the outcome in the control group and take the difference. And typically what we're interested in is not exactly one kind of, of a subject or patient, whatever you're looking at, but some kind of an average over some kind of a target population. And what we're going to do is to make this general by saying that your target population has a density proportional to f of x times h of x, where h of x is some pre-specified function that you choose. So what we're doing is taking the combined population and then modifying the distribution by some function h, which a uh, function of the covariates. And this gives us the, the target population over which we're going to try to get an estimate of the average treatment effect. So this tau h is just an average of tau of x uh, over x uh, weighted by h. And, and the numerator is, is the estimate uh, well, it's the quantity of interest, actually, and the denominator is just a normalizing constant. So this uh, is a kind of a general class of weighted average treatment effects. So this, this means that you can actually choose any H you like, and the decision about H is a scientific decision. It's a choice about what you're interested in measuring, and it should be regarded in that context as something that uh, it, it's a, a decision about the object of the research. It's not something that's uh, dictated by the data. Okay, so the weighted distributions uh, will will have if we weight the distributions of our data uh, in the appropriate way, we can get estimates that correspond to these weighted uh, average treatment effects. So if we have some uh, function uh, f of x, h of x, and we divide the, by f of x, f, f1 of x, which is f of x, e of x, then we get a, a weight h of x over e of x. So that's the weight that will, that, that, that's the ratio of the uh, desired density of x in, in the numerator of the first fraction to the observed density of x in, in the denominator. And if you weight by that ratio, then your weighted distribution is just going to be the target density f of x, h of x. And, and you can see that the difference between the weights for the treatment in the control group is that in the treatment group, you divide by e of x and in the control group, you divide by 1 minus e of x. So th these uh, two factors, or two divisors, which are uh, just simple functions of the propensity score, are de define the different weights that you need in order to create balance. So the first property here is that the wh any weights of this form uh, balance the expectation of the covariates in the treatment in the control groups. And the, that's the formal statement of that property. Where so, this this uh, factor g over here means essentially you're selecting the treated patient, <coughs> waiting by that e one of x, and taking the expectation of x to that factor. And here, the same thing with respect to the uh, the control group. So here's a few common choices. Uh, the Harvitz-Thompson weights are 1 over Ex and 1 over e, uh, 
1 minus e of x, and h of x there is 1. Now remember the target density is the density of the combined population times h of x. So this says that we're just trying to get an estimate that corresponds to the, the average over the combined population of the two groups. But you see you've got that e of x and 1 minus e of x in the denominator. And that's the troublesome piece in the weighting, it's because e of x could approach 0 or 1. And in that case, you're dividing by some very small number, and you get very large weights. Uh, another choice is the treated group. Uh, so in the, the treated group is defined by saying h of x equals e of x, which means you're just take, going to take the population as a whole and, and weight the, the covariate distribution by the probability of being treated. So this gives you a group that looks like the treated group. And again, the weights uh, involve a denominator with, with a uh, number that could possibly approach 0. Uh, similarly, with the, if you wanted to wait to the control, it's uh, the same thing, just reversing the, the functions, the, the uh, roles of the two. Now, one proposal, since these uh, extreme values of the propensity score are troublesome, is to uh, truncate the distribution of the, trunc of the propensity score. So essentially, to look at the, uh, the, the covariate values for which the assignment to treatment and control group is is not too close to 100% treated or 100% controlled. And, and that's the uh, truncated uh, distribution. Um, is it really a, trunc a truncation of the combined distribution to take off the, the cases, for which you really have very little data to make a comparison because almost everybody is treated or almost everyone is controlled. Uh, finally, the, the one I'm particularly interested in talking about is what I call the overlap weight. And this one has a weight, uh, a, a, a distribution which is related to the base distribution of the entire data set by a factor of e of x times 1 minus e of x. So this is a, a, a weight which truncates in a sense because as you go to e of x equals 0 or 1, this product becomes smaller. But it doesn't truncate by setting an arbitrary truncation point. It just sets a, a, a down weighting as you go towards the tails. And in this one, it actually differs from everything else on this list by the, the fact that there's no number that can approach 0 in the denominator. It's no denominator. Uh, so you don't have to worry about having extreme weights in this case. I'll, I'll mention, by the way, that, as I said, the, the choice of, of the weighting scheme is a scientific decision. And it could be quite interesting, especially in a, an exploratory analysis, to choose weight, weights that are uh, essentially defined subgroups related to the propensity score. So if you were interested in looking at w which groups were uh, most likely to benefit from the treatment, uh, w one way you might do this would be to look at the groups that have very low rates of treatment and, and form, let's say, windows of, de let's say, deciles of the propensity score. So you, you have a whole s series of groups that have anything from a very low probability of treatment to the highest probability of treatment and see whether the uh, treatment effect is estimated in this way varies across those groups. So there, you could really have a, you have a lot of leeway in choosing uh, what subgroup you're going to look at as, as long as you d define the uh, probability, well, the, the, the weight of that subgroup relative to the population, which could be zero, as, as a uh, function of the covariates. OK, so assuming unconfoundedness, so I'm, I'm sort of going back and forth here between things which are explicitly causal and things which are more descriptive because the, the mechanics of the weighting is the same. If, if you assume unconfoundedness, the causal effect uh, can be identified from observed data uh, be, because uh, the, the unconfoundedness assumption assumes that the outcomes are independent of the actual assignment. The potential outcomes are independent of the assignment. In other words, the assumption is just that your covariates 
that are measured and that you can use in, in the uh, weighting procedure or matching procedure include everything that's associated with the uh, potential outcomes. Uh, so let's think about how we would do our estimation. So I'm, I'm going to use some you know, slightly sloppy notation here because we don't want to get caught up in measure theory. But we'll suppose that we think of some neighborhood dx of x, a, a neighborhood in the sense that it, it's uh, values that are close to x and, and therefore such that the expected outcomes are approximately the same. And this could be just a point if you have only discrete data, or discrete variables. So you, you could think of the natural non-parametric estimator of the expectation of y in that neighborhood as just being the observed mean of y uh, for the observations in that neighborhood. So we can then ex extend this to looking at the comparison between the two groups. And, and we just have an estimate of the uh, treatment effect in that neighborhood, which is y bar 1, the, the mean of the observed values in that neighborhood, minus the, for, for those who are treated, minus the corresponding mean for those who are not treated, the control group. And then if we're interested in the weighted average, we just take this quantity and integrate it with respect to dx. Uh, with, with weights given by our target distribution, f of x, h of x. So uh, th this is an, an essentially a large sample description of how you would do this estimation. Now, this integral can be estimated, it, further estimated by uh, taking the data and calculating sums with weights. So it's just an estimation of a of an integral uh, by, by averages, uh, sample averages. And, and that gives us our weighted estimator, where the first term is weighted by w1, second term is weighted by w0. And uh, in large samples, we know that this will approach the quantity we're interested in. OK, so just, just to give a very crude picture, some of you may have seen this, these slides before. Uh, of, of what's going on here. Suppose that we have a, uh, a sample with, which I'm going to just break up into uh, ranges of the propensity score. And uh, we, we have very low values of the propensity score, or almost nobody is treated, ranging up to high values of the propensity score, or almost everybody is treated. And uh, we, we can then, uh, do matching, that would be one approach, and we would match cases with similar values of the propensity score. And, and so we might take one case out of the uh, first group uh, from each, and the second group we could take one from each, or we could take two from each and match them, uh, and so forth uh, up, up to the last group. But notice if we do a one-to-one -one match, we're, we're going to throw away most of the data in, in the first group in the control group, and we're going to throw away most of the data in the last group in, in the treated group. So rather than doing that, we, we might like to compare the, the one observation over here in the treated group in, in the lowest uh, range of propensity score to the mean of all of these guys over here. And to do that, okay, so this is what would happen if you just took those matches. Uh, but instead of doing that, we, we might just choose weights that equate the total weight for each of these uh, ranges here, which you think of as a dx of one of these neighborhoods. So uh, the weighting that we're suggesting here, this overlap weight, w would weight the cases up here by 1 minus the propensity score, uh, well, the treated cases by 1 minus the propensity score. So that's 1 minus 1 tenth, because 1 out of 10 here are, are treated. So that's our one observation times 9 tenths. And we weight these cases here by the propensity score, which is uh, average is about 1 tenth. So it's, so it's 9 times 1 tenth. So the total weight given to this uh, neighborhood in a propensity score distribution 
is the same for the treated and controlled groups, and therefore we have balance. And we just go ahead in the same way through, through every group. In the last one, we're now taking uh, these eight cases and each giving each one a weight of one ninth because there are eight eight out of nine are 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 treated, and this case over here gets a weight of one ninth, uh, one one times eight ninths. So in every in every DX, every neighborhood here, you're giving the same weight to to the. Uh, the, the treated cases and the control cases. And if you think of these neighborhoods then getting smaller and smaller, uh, and I've, I'm just looking at the propensity score here because the, the theory of the propensity score is, is that if you've got the model correctly specified, you will get co balance on all covariates as well as balance on the score itself. Okay, so there, there are a couple of results. Again, these are large sample results about variance which are relevant here. Uh, one of them is that given a normalizing constant uh, set to one, which is just for, just for convenience of notation, the large sample variance of the estimator is given by this quantity. So if you look at what's going on here, uh, th this is the weighting factor for, the, for a given value of x, and this is our measure. And uh, we have v1 of x over e of x, and this is for the, the balancing, the, the uh, overlap weights, and V0 of x over 1 minus E of x. And that just follows directly from the, the factors which are, they're multiplied by in the weighting. And this V is, is like a local variance, re local residual variance if you are modeling at the afterwards. The, the second piece which follows from this very directly is that in a homoscedastic situation, so you know, if you don't know anything about your data and you, you make just kind of very vanilla assumptions that to, to do your design, uh, of, of which the most obvious one would be that the variance, the, the residual variance is constant and the same in the treated and control groups, then the, this choice H of X equals E of X times one minus E of X gives the smallest asymptotic variance for the weighted estimator. And, and this, this uh, formula gives, the, gives that variance. So what, what we're doing is we're essentially squeezing as much as we can out of every range of the propensity score. So in, in the range of the propensity score where it, there's a great deal of imbalance, we're downweighting because the estimate's going to be inefficient and, and have a large variance dictated by the smaller group. And in the middle, we, we don't downweight as much, and and we give more more weight to the results. So that, that again, this is a large sample result, but it's uh, not irrelevant to a lot of studies. So this overlap weight is is given by e of x times one minus e of x, and it's d defined by the overlap of the covariates in a way that's something like that truncation weight, but it it doesn't have a sharp cutoff that's somewhat arbitrary. It's doing things smoothly. And it's also doing weighting throughout the entire range. It's not weighting everything equally in the middle and then suddenly dropping off to zero. But the, the, the concept is somewhat similar. Now, one, one thing about this, you, you want to think about the scientific interpretation of this. And I think this is not, not a stupid thing to be interested in from a scientific point of view. As I said, you know, the scientist has to decide what they want to study. But the, the uh, in, in a clinical study, what we're doing is essentially giving the most weight to the group of patients who are uh, in equipoise, uh, clinical equipoise, meaning that you, ju you just don't know which one is, the, the world doesn't know which of the two treatments to give. It's giving the 50-50 uh, uh, treatment and control or you know, old treatment and new treatment. And as you go off towards the uh, high end of the propensity score, we, we get to the region where almost everyone agrees that you should um, give the treatment, or the other direction, almost everyone agrees that you shouldn't give the treatment. And, and if you're trying to do a study, well, in the first place, you have very little data to base a comparison on in those regions, but also the, the place where you might be likely to make the most impact is in figuring out what's going on with the people that are near the middle where the, the world really doesn't know what to do yet. And, and is in balance. 
And from an ethical point of view, I think there's also an argument that you, you want to do your experiments on, on treatments that are in, with populations that are in clinical equipoise, where, where you don't or already have a clear idea of what's needed. Yeah, thank you. I, I needed someone to ask a question, and, and maybe the floodgates will break, and I'll get 200 questions now. Right. Right. So the regression, the, re the regression setup would, uh, if you do it right, would automatically uh, gi give give the weighting that's optimal for these squares, which would be these weights. Yeah. Well, the th th that gets into this old issue about. Estimated versus known propensity scores. Yeah, right. So I'm, I'm assuming actually known propensity scores here. Okay, so just to illustrate how this works, this is a sort of obvious theoretical example. Two normally distributed populations, or well, one one population that has that the black line as its combined distribution, and uh, the densities of, of the treated and control groups are normal. And if, if you, uh, let me have to go back. If you look at the, the weighting, uh, these weights are going to go to infinity in the tails. And what you're trying to do, uh, let's say for the, this is, I guess, the control group, the, the, you, you need a weight that makes this density here look like this. So that's what the Harvard Thompson weighting tries to do. And it's easy to show that, that those weights not only uh, can go to infinity in the tails with this distribution, but actually don't have an expectation or a variance. So uh, the, the idea that you can get the expected harvest thompson weighting of this is actually kind of a theoretical contradiction. And, and similarly here, if you're trying to weight the treated cases to look like the combined distribution, you're going to get infinite weights for the treated cases here. So this is just a very simple example of why the, those Harvard Thompson weights don't make sense. Um, it, this is an example uh, of using the overlap weights. And in, in this case, the uh, weights go like this. They go from 1 down to 0 and from 0 to 1 for the, for the two groups, and the combined uh, estimate that you get using those weights is going to be weighting the original population like this. Well, actually, the, well, this is what the population looks like with that weighting, actually, the combined population. So you have your uh, weights going to zero this way, weights going to zero this way, and what you're left with is something like this, which emphasizes the cases that are near balance. Okay, so what, what are some advantages of this? And by the way, I'm not here to sell this to you, so I won't be just talking about advantages. Uh, first of all, th this minimum variance property is a nice one in cases where, where you don't have so much data that variance is not a concern. Uh, a second property uh, is that if you have a logistic propensity score model, you, you get exact small sample balance uh, for, for the means of any included covariates. So, this, is, to me, is a, a nice property that you actually know in advance that, that certain things will be perfectly balanced, namely the, the means of anything you put in the model. And so if you see an imbalance on, on, some, on the mean of some quantity, you just put that in the model, and immediately it's going to be perfectly balanced. And you know, I, I, I argue with my collaborators who want to put that in the table, you know, P equals uh, 1. Or, well, it's a mathematical fact that those things are going to be the same. Uh, bound, the weights are bounded, and we don't do any kind of arbitrary elimination of cases. And, and then I've talked about these other uh, factors from a scientific point of view, that it focuses attention on those which are 
most in equipoise and therefore uh, if the decision is something like a clinical decision where there's going to be some kind of a, 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 a guideline or a rule, you're looking at the ones w where there's the least knowledge or the least consensus on what to do. Uh, if you're looking at something that's more like a, a voluntary choice that people make in the population, it may, may be that the, the kind of people who are half the time doing something and half the time not doing it may be the ones who are most subject to influence. So again, if you have a subgroups in which 99% of the people use treatment one rather than zero, the, your ability to change their behavior may be very limited, but the ones who are in the middle may, may be more subject to influence through some policies. Here's a, a simulated example, uh, d just drawing from normal distributions. And we're assuming an outcome with an additive treatment effect. And so let's see what, what happens when you look at these covariate distributions. Uh, unweighted, they're like, it's like this. And with the overlap weight, you, you get a pretty good balance using a, a simple propensity score model, logistic model. This, this is the Harvard's Thompson weight. And what happened was that there was one observation that was out here in the tail and another observation out here in its tail in the other group. And so you get this, this is kernel smooth. So this is probably just one observation here that's been smoothed out by a kernel. But, but you can see that this is one probably one observation here that has a huge weight and a, and a big impact on the results, which is why you, you get these large variances. Uh, so, in this simulation, the un unweighted, the, the correct uh, estimate is one. The unweighted estimate uh, uh, is 2.945. And the Harvard Thompson and average treatment effect for the treatment weightings give you these numbers, which are pretty far from the correct estimate because of those few extremely influential cases that are out in the tails and huge standard errors. So this is the kind of situation in which if you are going to do weighting, you should think about something like the overlap weight. Uh, in this real example, this is, I guess is one of the, the favorite examples that gets reanalyzed over and over again. Uh, the, these are the, the same options. Um, so uh, this is a sim simulation basically drawing from those distributions, uh, subsampling from that population. And you can see with the overlap weights, there's very little variation in the estimates and they're pretty well on target. And the, uh, th these just go all over the place and the unweighted go goes all over the place. Okay. So I'm going to wind up by talking about some good things and then some limitations of this approach. Uh, good things, uh, as I mentioned, the predictable exact balance and aggregates. So one thing that you might consider if you're doing matching and you're concerned that the matching doesn't give you good balance on some things, you can do a, a, um, a post-processing of the matching in which you weight the match data set. So going back to my starting point, in, in the matched data set, you're getting local balance. Now, it may be that because of, of the nature of the, the distributions in the two groups, even though you have local balance in the sense that everything is, every, every treated case is matched to a control case, that's pretty similar to it. If, if that balance has a systematic bias in it, you, you may end up with a difference in the aggregate at the end. And that could happen if you, you have a, a strong shift in one direction between the two groups. So one, one thing you might consider, if you find that even after doing your best matching, you have a substantial amount of imbalance, is to then do a weighting of the match data set. You, you can't, of course, if you've done the matching first and you use a match that's inefficient in the sense that you throw away a lot of data, you can't get that back by the weighting. So the optimality stuff goes away. But you can get the perfect balance that you might want. Uh, 
Another uh, property here is that as you build your propensity score model, you can look at what happens to the weights. So if, if you have all the weights equal, which would be a propensity score model with only an intercept, then you're, you're going to have efficiency in the sense that all your data are used, but you're, you're going to have uh, a lot of imbalance. And as you add more and more variables to the model, the weights are going to start to move apart from each other. Because the propensity scores are going to be predicted better and better, and you're, you're going to be moving more cases towards the tails. Now, the scientific interpretation of what's going on there is that with the more uh, parsimonious propensity score models, you're essentially willing to make some more assumptions about the uh, effect of, of, the co of the covariates on the outcome. So, it, for example, if I believed that the covariates had a, a purely additive effect on the outcome, I, I might be willing to use a, a pretty limited propensity score model that just had main effects, because all I need would be for the means to be uh, the same in the two groups. I, w I wouldn't be worried about interactions. And if, if I were concerned about some nonlinear effects or uh, about some uh, interactions between covariates, I would make the model more complicated, but I would pay a penalty for that. And, and that penalty would be quantified by the variance of the weights I get as I make the propensity score model richer and richer. And, and this allows you to think about the trade-off between more detailed balance on one side and the uh, loss of efficiency as, as you start moving matches away from each other on the other side. <coughs> now, I think conceptually you could say that as you add more and more to the model, in some sense you're approaching uh, uh, matching in the sense that your, your set of covariates in the model actually defines neighborhoods. And, and you're then doing your weighting to match uh, weights within those neighborhoods. So there's a, a kind of a relation between the two. And finally, this, this will accommodate weighted data without any difficulty. Now, there, there are a few things that are not so great about this, and uh, I'm sure he'll hear more about them during the discussion period. Uh, one is that the arguments for this are essentially large sample arguments. And, and there's, the, the reason we, we have to rely on large sample arguments here is that we're trying to do this without making assumptions about the kind of smoothness that exists in the treatment effects. If, if we had some kind of an explicit theory in advance about the, the treatment effects being smooth, we would know what kinds of things we have to balance. Uh, but we don't like to do that because of, we're, we're trying to do this as a pre-processing stage before doing the analysis that's motivated by the scientific theory about the treatment effects. And, and that means that there's some kind of judgment involved w without an explicit modeling in deciding how to, how to do the weighting. A second issue here is that it's really important for the propensity score model to give accurate predictions of, of the propensity scores. And this is not so true for something like uh, stratification or propensity score calipers, where really all you're using is the ordering of the scores. So you, you could have a, a propensity score model where the link function was really wrong, and, and, and consequently, if you did something like a, the hosmer show kind of uh, display, where you look at the comparison of the predicted probabilities for for a range of propensity scores and the observed probabilities of, uh, you know, empirical probabilities of, of uh, being in the treatment group, they, you might have a, a substantial mismatch in certain ranges, uh, but it wouldn't matter too much to a stratification because they're still within, the, you're, you're grouping observations together that are in the same range. But here, because we're actually calculating the weights from the propensity scores, the propensity score model has to be right, uh, right in quotation marks, uh, air quotes, uh, in, in order to get those, those uh, weights right. And 
So this means that you, you should probably give some attention to at least checking that, which is a good exercise anyway, because you'd like to, to see whether your propensity score model is, is working reasonably well. And then you might want to use a flexible link function, which you could do, for example, by uh, putting in splines or even, even dummy variables for de deciles, which are order zero splines, uh, or, or something of that sort to make sure that the fit is pretty good. Uh, a third uh, limitation here is that there is a potential uh, variance reduction in a matched data set if you, if you give it a matched pairs analysis. So you, you can calculate the treatment effect for actual pairs of observations. And you may, if, if the covariates are predictive of, in the same direction of, of the uh, outcomes and with, with both potential outcomes, then you, you get a variance reduction in that way. And you don't really get that with the weighting because you're not making pairs of observations. You're just matching the distributions rather than matching the observations. Uh, of course, if you're relying on models in the analysis stage, your models may take care of that because you, you can uh, model out some of the, some of the predictable effects of, of the covariates, and then the residual variances are like more likely to be uh, res residual uh, errors rather are more likely to be uh, uncorrelated. And the, finally, uh, in matching, it, when you, you may start out by matching the distributions of the propensity scores. But you also get some benefit in directions orthogonal to the uh, direction measured by the propensity scores by matching things that are close to each other in, in other <coughs> respects. So if, if, let's say you're doing a, a Mahal and Elvis matching within calipers, you're, you're putting some effort at the beginning into making the propensity scores be pretty close for the, for the cases that you're going to match. But then after that, the mahal novus matching is, is trying to get you close in all variables at the same time, not, not just the direction corresponding to E of X. And so if your propensity score model is uh, misspecified in the sense that you're, you're missing some important covariates, which might be interactions, for example, then you, you control for some of that by, by doing an explicit matching with multiple Covariates involved, and not just the propensity score. So uh, that would point in the direction of having very rich models for the uh, um, weighting methods if you're going to use those. But again, there's a trade-off. The part of what you gain by the weighting model is that if you're in a situation where really every observation is very far from every other observation, which you know you're sort of basic cursive dimensionality problem where you, you put in more and more dimensions and things are never very similar to each other, then the, the, the weighting is one way of explicitly introducing main effects and focusing on the main effects, if, which might make sense from a scientific point of view. You, you want to get balance at least on the, the main effects of, or the, the, the means of the covariates before you, you focus on being nearby with respect to some complicated interaction. So just to conclude, uh, the, one of the main points here is to have a, a uh, kind of a unified framework for thinking about weighting and uh, to be able to characterize the, the entire class of balancing weights, thereby leaving it really in the hands of the scientists to think about which balancing weights to choose to, to get a distribution of covariates that corresponds to the questions they're interested in. Uh, we talk about the overlap weights, which are uh, have some nice properties if they fit with the scientific objectives. Uh, and we've pre presented some examples illustrating these properties. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, so that's it. So please, questions, comments? Yes, Chris.
Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd have to think a little more to, to say that uh, precisely. But it, essentially, in OLS, uh, you're, you're minimizing the sum of squares uh, of errors. So the, there's an explicit, an implicit weighting there that if, if you have a, if you think of your data as being broken up into strata of X, there's an implicit weighting there of the uh, data from the different strata, which is precision weighting. And, and that's essentially what this overlap weighting does as well. You know, the, getting the precision under a simple model of homoscedasticity and uh, equal variances in the two groups. I don't know, do, you, do you have a more precise the statement of that? Yeah. Right. Okay. So right. It's got, it's, got, it, it's got to live up to Gauss Markov, so it's got to be efficient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, except you, you don't have to be doing OLS as your analysis. Your, your analysis could be anything once you've weighted the data, just as it could be anything once you've matched the data. Yeah. Or, you know, fit a, fit a model which has some complicated structure. Right. So what we're doing here is not assuming a constant parameter, but, but defining an average with a weighting that would be the same one you would use if there were a constant parameter. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. So you talked about having the walls on the map, but if we were to convert it as a Richardson variance scale, so the things that that would require the analysis that you said that you have in the sense of what kind of richness, like how would you get that to where it fits? And is that even truly achievable for even just a pure political scientist that often doesn't have that need for variance? Well, I actually, um, I mean, the, the large sample argument is, has to do with, with the, uh, the statements about efficiency and, and unbiasedness without any assumptions about smoothness. So, you know, we're, we're saying that in, an, in a region DX that's potentially you know, with a continuous co covariate infinitely sm you know, infinitesimally small, that with a large enough sample, you're, you approach uh, the, the proportions that correspond to the uh, propensity score, or you know, the ratio E of X to one, one minus E of X for the treated and controlled counts in that cell. Uh, so, if you're willing to make, if you if you can specify more assumptions, then your requirement of a large sample 
you know, and why do we ever do asymptotic results? It, it's because we think that with finite populations that are that are not off in the horizon of asymptotia, the functions involved are well enough behaved that, that <coughs> things which work asymptotically also work pretty well with, with uh, finite samples that are not going to infinity. And, and that's sort of what's going on here. You know, the, the, if you assume some smoothness uh, or maybe even stronger assumptions, the, the more assumptions you're willing to make about the response surface, the, the uh, relationship between the expected um, potential outcomes and the x's, then the, the sooner these results, which are saved asymptotically, may actually t turn out to work well in the finite sample. So, uh, of course, with very large numbers of covariates, everything's very far from everything else. And, and then some kind of assumption of smoothness is required to say anything because you're never going to have exact matches. And, and defining what's an approximate match depends on what you think is an important covariate in a local way. But it seems important that the, that the, um, the, the assumptions for models correctly to specify. Because right. That, it all rests on that, right? Well, it all, it all rests on that, but you know, no model is ever perfectly correctly specified. So you know, in, in some sense, what we're saying, it's correctly specified with respect to the things that are going to make a difference to the outcome, which is not necessarily a prediction of you know, the exact probability for every possible s subject of being treated. I just try to think about if I were going to use this sort mm -hmm. of in an applied sense, like we all have in political science, where I only have a few covariates, but I have maybe a large sample. So this is a sample of, of what? Um, so we often, I mean, in in cities or uh -huh. well, that's a small state, sample. Or you could think about. So I, I do work on like um, how to make data about that. Uh -huh. So I think of that as the opposite. I think of so that as being small a small sample and a large covariate number of possible covariates. And so, at what point do these large? Where can I start thinking about it? I I can use this because I have a large enough sample. And where do I need to? I'm just trying to get a sense of how I would maybe apply this to something in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a fair question. Well, I I think you you might start by building uh, propensity score models and then thinking about what imbalances might potentially affect your outcome. So that's your some some scientific judgment uh, judgment without actually uh, doing the fitting of the models. And, and try to close those uh, imbalances by adding more terms to your model and, and then see whether the, the weights start becoming very extreme or, or it, it's really the uh, potential efficiency of the estimators that you might do become, gets worse and worse because you have nothing that matches. So you essentially you're, you're giving you might have one case where it's 50-50 and everything else is uh, propensity score 0.99 or 0.01. So you're, you're giving a huge weight to a very few cases. Well, w then you know you've gone too far in trying to establish balance for what your data can do. And it's, what it's analogous to is what happens in matching if you have a huge number of variables and you try to match very locally and, and you throw away cases that, are, that differ a small amount relative to how close things are together. But it, it's approaching it from a, a different direction in, in that we're, we're starting from a, a model that, that includes certain main effects. So we, we work the main effects down to uh, more detailed, either flexible forms or, or, or continuous variable or more interactions. And, and it's... Uh, in the matching world, I think you start the other way around. You start by trying to match exactly and then going, going to things that differ a little bit and maybe going further and further away until you, you're able to get enough matches that you have something to analyze. So the, the, the process is somewhat similar, but the way you build toward it is different with the model-based weighting.
Well, I, I think we're at least frank about the fact that there's some arbitrariness. You know, the, the reality is that the distribution of, of the treatments across the covariate space is going to determine what you can actually estimate. And I, I think uh, an article by uh, Guido Imbens and Joe Hotz and someone else, I forgot who the other author was, it's called something like setting the goalposts. You know, it's, it's just recognizing that when, when you do an observational analysis, you you don't really get to decide where in the covariate space you can get estimates. So you know the, the optimality property may or may not be com compelling, um, but it actually e even if you don't want to go exactly for that optimality property, it does tell you something about where in the covariate space do you have enough information to say something? And, and this essentially guides you away from cases where you're, you're trying to get estimates that, that are bound to be very sensitive to small fluctuations in the data. I, 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 if, if you have, you know, there are certain limiting cases where things do become very simple. For example, if the treated cases are very small and very few in number, so that the propensity score is always very small, then the average treatment effect for the treated and the overlap estimate we would get here are going to be almost the same. So that's a case where getting the estimate for the treated, because they all have lots of uh, control cases to match them, is really pretty much the most efficient thing you can do. But in cases where things are, are more balanced, uh, like, like our comparison of the 1990 and the 2000 hospital admissions, then, then I think you, you might as well uh, use, use something that's efficient if that's an issue for your estimation. And uh, you can describe qualitatively what it looks like, even though it doesn't correspond to any sharp definition of a population. I can't guarantee this will get by referees. I mean, some some of them really want something that's got a more traditional label attached to it, uh, and others don't really uh, mind this that much. But you know, unless you have a real scientific base, basis for choosing a particular population of interest, then doing it efficiently is maybe the best way to decide. No. If, if there are no more questions, I'm going to go eat lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Part of the advantage of in, in practice is that it's extremely simple, yeah. and and there, you know, this this whole cottage industry and matching methods just drives me nuts. And you know, you know, people come through and they've got one matching method after another, and, and there's no real. I mean, Gary's of course is exact matching. So yeah, I actually. It's a hot day. I, I, I read, it's rejected I read, by the Census Bureau. 
you know, what, what, 50 years ago, six, seven years ago, eight years ago? Yeah, I, I read his, his lecture notes and some of the preparation that they put in my background. Just terrible stuff. So, uh, it, it's, very, it's very simple, and uh, you, don't, you don't have to get involved in that. Really and, 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 and it's, uh, you know, it's efficient. So if you don't have any compelling scientific reason for one waiting or another, maybe it's a good thing to do. One comment, if you get to talk again, that may be useful for questions like that you came to the end. When you do have a randomized experiment, you have no idea what the, what the population is because of all these exclusion restrictions and uh, sure. informed consent. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, so, so it, the idea of, of sort of changing the target population according yeah. to convenience is absolutely all right, right. We do it all the time. Oh, it's much worse than a randomized yeah. experiment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But so that, that's sort of a, a real red herring. If you think of the randomized right. experiment as being the gold standard, we do win. It's much worse yeah. with respect to that, those issues. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. But just, to, just to, to put off, are you really worried about defining the, the target population? So w would you find this useful uh, if you had done matching and then you did your diagnostics and found some imbalance and, and you couldn't really figure out what was going on locally? I think I, th I think so, although I, I, I don't have a good feeling for it. When I do matching, it's typically to discover people who are out of either because I, I have the outcomes measured everywhere and I don't want to use those people because they just don't look anything like the treated. Um, or I haven't even done the use, haven't even collected any outcome data yet. But there's always some definition of, of what near and far oh, sure. that underlying yeah. Yeah. which uh, I don't know. Is, is there a lot of science involved in that definition in terms of knowing what the outcome model is going to look like? Or? Yeah, I think so. When, when, um, but, but, but you would have to base it only on, on prior evidence, right? Right, or, right. Or exactly. Right. 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 The Gox set up, this is for a, a, a hearing before FDA, but before it, we met, and Gox set up, and they all say, here is what we know about it. First time users of, of these combination or we'll, we'll look over here with them. Yeah. Yeah.